once again, James, very grateful to have you joining us today. We, we, we appreciate it. Um, so anyway, James, I'll drop off here and, and you have the floor. Uh oh, um, great, great, great. I'm uh, happy to be here. I need to uh, warn you guys um, one small typo on my slides. Well, maybe one uh, is that there's not 41 slides, uh, 41 uh, presentation decks. But let me say a little bit about what uh, what I'm presenting and what I want to present. And let me first share my screen. Uh, you guys can hear me, I assume. So let's sound great. Okay, you guys can see the, the presentation? Yes. Great. Right, so what I wanted to give a talk today, and this is something that um, I think it goes very much to the heart of how Cubrate was even founded and kind of where um, some of the impetus for uh, coming up with the ideas for Cubrate came in, was really thinking about how to teach and about ways that I like to teach. And, and um, Kanav is a uh, fantastic, uh, you know, he's done great work so far with Cubrate. And, and I think it's really amazing that um, how far Cubrate's come along and even Sandy just talking about how she's used it for teaching. I'm going to give a very different perspective on how to teach. Um, hopefully this also is pedantic so that you can also learn if you haven't seen it before, but hopefully a way to kind of encourage instructors to teach the instructor how to teach. And this is not just instructors here or instructors anywhere, but this is really thinking about textbooks and how textbooks present quantum mechanics. And what I'm going to do is try and give a what I think is a much richer way to understand quantum mechanics and give you um, a sense of how I want to approach this. Just FYI, it's not 41, it should be more like 15. So we'll keep it at 30 minutes, um, ideally. Um, yeah. So um, the way that I think about quantum mechanics and the way that I think of explaining quantum mechanics to whoever I'm talking to is really to start with probability. Probability is a very nice place to discuss, well, just about anything, because in probability, we have this very nice way of talking about many things that we don't understand, right? many things we don't understand. People talk about probability, there's all sorts of paradoxes in probability, all sorts of problems with probability, all sorts of ways to interpret probability. And what we'll see is that all this infects quantum mechanics quite naturally and pushes all these philosophical questions out. It also gives a much richer way of understanding how to begin. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how I came to this. Okay, so first, let me um, start off with a little bit about my own teaching philosophy. So my teaching philosophy, this is kind of funny. Uh, I don't know if Kanav is on the call. I think he, he, I'm not sure if he made it, but um, one of the things that happened during Kanav's PhD is that I was uh, an assistant professor, I still am, and I taught introductory mechanics. And I taught introductory mechanics multiple times, um, and it was not always successful from the student's point of view. But from my point of view, um, the students, you know, they had their comments about whether the class was their favorite or not. But from my point of view, I really enjoyed the class. I put a lot of effort into trying to make it the best course I could. And so I went through, thought about how the course is structured and thought about how we teach introductory mechanics. The way that we teach introductory mechanics is kinematics, and which we'll discuss quite a bit. This is just how things move and just constraints on how to treat a vector, how to treat velocity and acceleration, just as strictly as functions. We go from there, start talking about vectors and differential equations. This is F equals MA. You have your Newton's laws and these sort of things come in. But this is an entirely separate section after having a whole long discussion of kinematics. And only after we had the discussion of kinematics and then we had a discussion of forces, do we even try to introduce the concept of energy. Energy and eigenvalues is all very complicated ideas that come up very, very slowly. Uh, shout out to Kanaf. I see he's here. Um, so Kanaf knows my struggle with physics 13. Um, any case, um, here, all these concepts go one, two, three. So it's important that when we think of how to teach introductory quantum mechanics, we should also think the same thing. However, introductory quantum mechanics quite often starts from a very different perspective. And what I'm gonna do here today is tell you, um, for quantum mechanics, imagine if I told you don't need the postulates of quantum mechanics. Like a lot of books start off postulates of quantum mechanics and went back in preparation for today's lecture, or today's talk, I went back and looked at my old quantum books. Every book that said quantum mechanics on it, I opened it and see what, what would it said. Half the book said postulates of quantum mechanics. The other half of the book started with the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation, you also don't need to discuss quantum mechanics. And I think that for a lot of people is a bit surprising, especially depending on how you learned it or where you learned it. And what I'm gonna to do today is try and convince you that you don't need either of these two things. I mean, they show up very naturally and from the probability first point of view, but these aren't things you need to discuss quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, and this, especially depending on what the basis for your discussion is. So if you're a physicist, of course, you need Schrodinger's equation to talk about time evolution. But if you're a computer science, maybe Schrodinger's equation is not really relevant. Maybe you don't care about differential equations, only care about, you know, one circuit element to the next. And then Schrodinger's equation is not particularly relevant. 
maybe discrete version of it. And if you don't conserve energy, then it's really not relevant at all. So there's many reasons that you don't need Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so this is kind of a uh, discussion with the teachers here, so to speak. And what I'm gonna try and do is unpack the main ideas of probability first. Uh, just the wrong, yeah, this is fine. All right, yeah, so what I wanna do is kind of introduce some things, uh, when I give advice to people about how to give talks, some of my students ask me, uh, you know, practice presenting. And what I say for all presentations, everyone likes to hear things they already know. Okay, so I'm gonna assume you guys have heard of probability vectors. And for those of you who haven't, welcome to today. Uh, probability vector is just a list of numbers and we put it inside of a, inside of a vector format. This is just a way of uh, organizing numbers that we call vectors. And we have these numbers, P, I, uh, P1, P2, P3. And each one of these numbers is from the real elements. So they're just real numbers. And they're all greater than or equal to zero. And we're gonna assume that this vector is normalized to the number one. And this vector norm here is just summing up all the matrix elements, the absolute value of, the matrix, of these elements and adding them up to one. So here's an example. You know, we have uh, some probability of the first event, probably the second event, probably the third event. This is 80%, this is 0.5%, this is 0.05, this is 5%, 15, and 80%. And here's another vector with four elements, and this is the same idea. This vector we'll return back to a bit later. Right now, what I want to do is introduce the notion of vectors, okay? Um, and, and these vectors here, you note that this is a probability state. I've not mentioned wave functions. I will not mention wave functions at all during this talk, maybe at the end, but the concept of the wave function is not a very good one, in my opinion. Um, it's functional, but not very good for learning. So if we start off with this notion of probability states here, um, and then what, we, what I wanna emphasize here is that PI is the probability of the ith outcome resulting from a measurement. This is not a trivial statement to make. Um, and the statement introduces a lot of the philosophical issues of quantum mechanics. We talk of measurement inside of quantum mechanics, what does the wave function mean? Is the wave function real or not? How do we realize these outcomes? These are all questions that you can ask and they're valid questions, but these are questions at the level of probability. These aren't questions at the level of quantum mechanics. And so we're gonna put them here and that will be the first place that we put them. We're gonna leave them here. So if you have any questions about philosophy, a probability, about what does a probability function mean? Is it real or not? This is the time to ask them. Um, if we were longer talking, normally I'd pause for longer, but I uh, only have 30 minutes, so I'm not going to uh, belabor this point, but feel free to type in questions if you have anything here, if you have any comments. But this is really where you can get the grounding and philosophy, the grounding in postulates and whatever sort of things that a lot of these books start off with is all being coming from probability. So how do we actually realize an outcome? What happens to the probability function after measurement occurs? Does it collapse? Or does it, you know, is it updated in some way, shape, or form? But all these questions are questions of probability state vectors. Okay. So again, the measurement postulate is here. PI is the probability of the ith outcome resulting from a measurement. That's a very deep statement that's complicated to unpack. And it's not really complicated until you start getting into the weeds. And so at this level, it's all fine. And that's how we should treat quantum mechanics. If you're okay with the statement, then you're okay with quantum foundations. Okay. Um, I say probability first, and I say probability first because linear algebra shows up naturally when you're doing probability. So if you take a, a reasonable introduction to probability, then you'll show up with um, you show up with this notion of matrix multiplication very easily. Um, for matrix multiplication, um, yeah. So there's none of these numbers are squared. These are the actual probabilities. This is a probability vector. There's not a probability. There's not a wave function. No squared. Right. You just add up 0 0.8 plus 0.25. Uh, doesn't add up, does it? 0 0.15, 0 0.8, and 0 0.05 adds up to um, exactly uh, one. Um, probability amplitudes, there's no probability amplitudes. We're just talking probabilities here only, um, just, as a, just as a reminder. There's no quantum mechanics yet, so don't, don't pull in things you haven't, um, you've heard or just kind of heard in passing. So right now, what we're gonna do is try and develop it naturally. Um, so let me just emphasize here that this is a transition probability. This is a probability transferring from some event K to event J, and it's just a transfer probability. So if you think of what happens, um, if you imagine that someone's playing the cup game where they're moving around two cups or three cups, um, and, and this is the probability that cup two didn't move, this is a probability swap cup two and went to where cup one is. This is a transition that the probability that cup two went to cup one, the probability that cup three went back to cup three. So these are different probabilities, and these need to be sensibly organized and sensibly added up. So if, this, if you're at site K, well, you have some probability of going somewhere. So the probabilities over all values of J will add up to one. Right? So this is, really, this is really from the definition that if I talk of the probability of transfer, well, the probability adds up to one and what are all the possible places you transfer to? And this gives you a very natural 
notion of transforming a probability distribution. Okay, so this formula here has indices. You have a J and a K, you have a P sub K here. And this capital, this uh, I and this F is for initial and final. So this is some transformation from initial probability distribution to some final one. Okay, and then we can reorganize the statement at the top, uh, this, this composition rule to transform probability vectors into a very natural definition of matrix multiplication. So this would be the time to insert into your lecture series or wherever you're at, um, depending on where you're learning it, who's learning it, or you know, how much you need to teach. This is where I would insert linear algebra. This is a very natural way to bring in matrix multiplication. You can talk about inner products very naturally here. Um, you take the inner product of the, of the uh, column vector with the first row, and it gives you the first element. Uh, of the output vector, so on and so forth. So it's a very natural way to introduce the notion of linear algebra, introduce the notion of, of, uh, of, of transformations in, in vectors and matrices. Um, that I think in quantum mechanics, right on the Schrodinger equation, all these things show up too quickly. There's a very natural way to kind of arrive here. And you can give a lot of very natural intuitive examples of, of Markov chains and probability transformations, okay? Um, so this is all I want to say about probability today. Um, obviously, if you know more about probability, then just import it all. And what I'll do is I'll give you a very nice way to bring everything you know about probability to bear on quantum mechanics and, and vice, and not vice versa, but everything you know about probability will enter into quantum mechanics. So if you know a uh, continuous version of the statement, if you know continuous probability distributions, if you know uh, stochastic processes, if you know uh, statistical interpretations, if you know machine learning, all these things import quite nicely when we go to what I call the quantum lift. And I think this is natural for those of you who know a lot of quantum mechanics. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is introduce this notion of a diagonal probability vector. And so we're just gonna take a, now it becomes a matrix. So now we have a diagonal probability matrix. And this probability vector here that we had from the very first slide, 25%, 50%, 15%, 10%, well now we're just gonna put in the diagonal of a matrix, okay? Those of you who know MATLAB or have been coding in Python, this is the diag function. So we take a vector and you type in diag. And in a lot of different languages, it'll put these numbers along the diag. Okay. Um, the, this probability vector has different events that are going to be represented by the basis vectors E sub K. All what these basis vectors mean and how these things work, this is all still in a probability in the discussion of probability functions. So if you have any questions there, you need to go back to your probability book. Now, we take these same event vectors, these vectors corresponding to events, then we can take an outer product of these events and that gives us the different diagonal matrix elements, okay? That made sense, hopefully it does, um, otherwise it's okay. Um, just saying that the probability of the third outcome is the three, three element of this matrix, okay? Now to kind of draw this connection between quantum mechanics and probability a little bit tighter, what we're gonna do here is take this quantum lift that we just introduced and we're gonna take the prop properties that we needed for the vector version of the probability vector to the quantum matrix version of the same thing. So if you think of this probability vector being normalized to one, we can think of this density matrix, this state, the quantum state vector being normalized to one, but now we're gonna take the trace of this matrix. We're gonna sum up all the elements along the diagonal of this matrix and it will sum up to one. Uh, so uh, there's a question in the, in the slides that says, are, are the slides available and these course notes available? Sort of. They are, just send me an email. It's probably the easiest way to get them. Um, th yeah, th that's the easiest way for now. Um, maybe they'll be released more widely, but um, I'm happy to share these. Uh, all right, so then the second um, property of probability state is that we need each entry of that probability vector to be real. We get the same condition for the eigenvalues of this as the state if we say that row is equal to row dagger. Okay, this is maybe a little advanced for, um, for the sake of just you know someone walking in off the street, but this condition here, row equals to row dagger, is enforcing effectively the same condition that these uh, probability entries have to be real. We're going to assume that the same way these probability values have to be greater than zero, we're going to assume that every diagonal element of this density matrix, no matter what we form for a diagonal, is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is this is the right way to think about it, is that these are the one-to-one the -one correspondence of each property. This is positive semi-definite, and this is the probability vectors, the probability entries are greater than zero. This is that um, the eigenvalues are real. Here, the probability entries are real, and that the normalization of these two systems are all both normalized to one, such that we get back a sensible notion of probability, okay? All right, um, just to kind of highlight this a little bit more and maybe connect to some things you've heard of, 
Um, when people talk of quantum decoherence, they talk of decoherence and quantum noise. Um, what's happening is that they're discussing this formulation of quantum mechanics, where you think of a uh, quantum state, and your quantum state has probabilities along the diagonal, but it also can have off-diagonal entries, as long as it satisfies these three properties. These entries can be whatever they want, and this is the point where you'd have to introduce complex numbers if one has not heard of that. Um, but nonetheless, this is also a natural time to start introducing a lot of the concepts that are already covered inside of Cubraid quite well and covered in many places quite well. It's just to give a framework to get to quantum with all the things that you already know and have it show up much more naturally. So when you talk of noise and decoherence process, you're just making these coherences go back to zero. So what does that mean? That means that we, if we get rid of all the coherences, then we're back to an ordinary probability vector uh, a probability vector that's been lifted to the quantum setting, right? So you just have the probability vector along the, along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Um, and if that's the case, then we can actually come up with the map. This is called decoherent projection of the quantum state, okay? Um, it's not so important that I go through all the details here, but this is perhaps the point, is that we go through this map and this map gives us back a diagonal density, a diagonal density matrix diagonal quantum state that's Inter interpreted completely with ordinary probability. So um, if you ask me, what do I think of quantum measurement, quantum measurement problems, there is no measurement in quantum mechanics. What you have is decoherence to get to classical probability. And once you're in classical probability, then you deal with measurement, however you dealt with measurement and probability theory, uh, you know, however you dealt with it. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, so this is one type of transformation of uh, a valid state to another valid state. Okay, so I took a state, any state that it was, and I'm uh, acting with some projectors, these square back to themselves, and they're just throwing away all the off diagonal entries of this matrix inside of some particular basis. Okay, so if you haven't seen this, I can't teach it all in 30 minutes, so that's okay. Um, so now, if we want to go a little bit further and get to how this connects maybe to more elementary formalism, um, we can think of how we actually change the basis. Um, so in, in quantum mechanics and linear algebra, we change the basis using a change of basis matrix. This is typically a unitary matrix that preserves the length of the vectors, okay? Um, and so what we can do is actually just act with the unitary matrix in the left and right, and that just changes the basis in which this density matrix is written down. So you can think that you change the basis and diagonalize the matrix, and that's exactly what um, that's exactly a unitary transformation that you might know from your linear algebra course. And if you don't, this would be a perfect time to learn what is uh, the eigenvalue decomposition in terms of unitary matrices. Well, this is just a unitary matrix that diagonalizes a row, okay? Um, and that's one way to think about this. Um, and then we can also think about this in another way. If we think of how this goes to the quantum case, uh, how we get to the quantum case, so we had this uh, transition probabilities. So we can build the transition probability matrix. Um, so it says, what is the basis? Uh, uh, it's vector space ba basis. Um, it's, not, it's not super uh, intuitive, but if we think of a matrix, right? A matrix written down over a vector space, it transforms one vector space to another. And whatever vector space you're using to write down this matrix is considered the basis for this matrix to be written down. In the case that we're discussing here, these are our basis vectors. These are vectors from your, uh, if you had three dimensions, you'd have your X, Y, and Z vectors spanning the space. If you had, a, I don't know, some other system that had k dimensions and you need k vectors that are orthogonal to span the space, but which k vectors you choose that are orthogonal is not important. And that's where you can change the basis by rotating everything. So if you think of the XYZ coordinate system, I can rotate this XYZ coordinate system uh, by some angle and whatever angle I rotate, it still spans the same XYZ coordinate space. And that's just a change of basis. And you can even think of that rotation of the XYZ vectors as some U here for this change of basis. Um, hopefully that, that answers anonymous attendees question there. Um, in any case, what we have here is that uh, if we think of this P sigma as just being some permutation, um, if we add up these permutations with some convex sum, then what we end up with is a uh, bistochastic, or bistochastic transformation of this probability vector that takes our initial vector to our final vector. And we can do the same exact thing for the quantum state if we take the same probability vector this, uh, and we make it into our density matrix, the same as we discussed before. And then we act with this, uh, with the convex sum of these permutations, but now we're gonna do in the left and right. So we're just gonna basically expand everything we had for this vector formulation. So now instead of treating the vectors, we're treating those matrices. And, and then to transform a vector, we do a matrix times a vector, but to transform a matrix, we do a matrix from the left 
times that matrix and a matrix from the right times that uh, vector or that times that matrix to get a transformation of the matrix. And that's what you see here. So it's quantum lift of the probability vector, vector. If you check this, take a screenshot, you can check that this confirm that these things work um, if you've been following well enough. And the idea is that when we go to the quantum situation, we talk of stochastic change of basis. This is where you get to really nice things connected to very complicated ideas inside of um, quantum technology these days, decoherence and control um, and, and error correction, all these different things, is that you're going to have some errors. So now instead of applying a deterministic change of basis, you're going to apply this change of basis with some probabilities. And we change these probabilities, and these probabilities will will then be the probability of applying unitary one or applying an error um, for unitary one prime or for doing some continuous control pulse. This might be an integral over different probability uh, over an continuous probability distribution. But nonetheless, it's just the same idea of a stochastic change of basis in the classical case, some linear combination of permutation matrices. Okay, um, so then just gathering up kinematics, uh, which is all we're gonna do today. Um, so, so far we introduced a projective measurement type one, and which is stochastic change of basis, which captures most of what you'd learn inside your elementary quantum course. Um, the most general formulation of this is this Krauss operator sum representation. This is a fantastic place to really draw a nice connection between um, how we do kinematics and probability and how we do kinematics in terms of quantum. So for kinematics in terms of quantum, this equation here comes about from just strictly satisfying the input a state is a, is a valid quantum state and the output state is also a valid quantum state. And if you, do, you just follow those, those conditions along the full chain of mathematics, you end up with this expression at the final equation, as, as a final expression. You can go back and check this, take a screenshot and see that this actually conforms with the three properties that I gave earlier. Okay, uh, pushing up on the uh, 30 minute mark. So I'm gonna stop here uh, and just say a few words uh, about what the overall takeaway from here should be. Is that if you think about how I introduce quantum mechanics and how um, I would suggest you think about quantum mechanics is perhaps a very nice talk to be kind of in between the teaching side of things and the application side. Is that this gives you a nice way to think about how applications fit into the schema of thinking about probability and quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics as an extension of probability in a way that's going to give a very nice interpretation. So this quantum, this quantum uh, probability first approach is consistent with any interpretation of probability. So there's a lot of interpretations of probability that are complicated, but this means that we don't need interpretation for quantum mechanics. There's very little interpretation of quantum mechanics needed. Um, in any interpretation of quantum mechanics that you read about, it has an equivalent probability formulation of, of that same interpretation. Uh, many worlds and, and frequentists and and cubism and all these different ideas of quantum interpretations are all connected to the probabilistic interpretation. Um, this probabilistic correlations connects easily to what we discussed as quantum entanglement. We could talk of entropy inside of um, probabilistic setting and entropy inside the quantum setting. This gives rise to a whole beautiful field of work. Um, we talk about error correction inside of um, you know uh, coding theory, error correction inside of probabilistic uh, communication channels, and then we talk of quantum error correction quantum communication and quantum situations. Superposition, Heisenberg uncertainty that are quite often um, brought up inside the first discussion of quantum mechanics, I think don't need to come in at all, to be honest, just because superposition is the same thing in classical mechanics. So it's only interesting because we're dealing with linear systems. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is really just a property of Fourier transforms and it shows up exactly the same inside of signal processing. Um, there's a few subtleties there if you talk about energy time, um, but in general, um, this is, my introduction to quantum mechanics. And uh, yeah, I could say a little bit more about wave functions and about standard topics, but let me stop here. If you're interested in these slides, just send me an email and I can send it over um, and I can, I can uh, discuss. So, oh, so there's a question here. Uh, many quantum authors claim superposition is not a classical phenomenon. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you misunderstood them or they misunderstood it, but if you think about a string being plucked, um, this is also a linear equation, it's a wave equation. And, or you think about um, a water, you know, dropping a, a stone inside of a pond is also a linear equation, a wave equation. And all these wave equations, you get superposition of waves, right? So you think about the sounds that I'm speaking, you can decompose this into the Fourier components and that would be decomposing in a superposition of waves. So superposition is really um, not really a quantum thing. It's just a, a fact that we're in linear systems and, and we're in linear systems quite often.
uh, for many, many other situations in classical and quantum situations. All right. Thanks, James. This is uh, all great info. I know uh, my my head spinning, like I said, being a neophyte, but just uh, at least I can still pull on some past knowledge to understand some of these concepts. Uh, I guess uh, a few questions we have from our end is, um, you know, what excites you most about the industry and, and where things are headed um, from your perspective? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So I, I guess... Um... I guess I'll give that answer, but in the context of the talk I gave, um, and I'll say from this point of view um, and where this came from. So a large portion of why I was thinking about how to teach and discuss quantum mechanics is definitely my work with QBraid and my work more broadly inside of quantum education. Quantum education is difficult and not difficult because it's hard or because you, know, you need to teach it this way or that way, but it's difficult because so many people are coming in with such diverse backgrounds. And so as people become interested in quantum, they're coming from many different directions. Some people coming in with information theory background, coming in with computer science background, coming in with engineering focus, coming in with maybe a financial focus, right? In all these situations, people use probability. You know, you could be a gambler and learn quantum mechanics from this approach. And so this is really to make it accessible to as many people as possible. That if the idea is that we want the quantum industry to grow, we want people to adopt and use quantum devices, then how do we teach them what quantum is? We teach them in a way that's gonna be most accessible to the most amount of people. And from here, you can go in any direction you want. You can go back to physics, you can go to mechanics, you can go wherever you think is gonna be the next step for you in whatever course you're teaching. But this is just a nice way to, to frame the whole conversation. Uh, so we touched on it a little bit with Sandy previously, but uh, just curious, do you, do you think then that this is, um, you know, kind of foundational learning that we should start to introduce earlier and earlier, uh, just for the impacts it has across all the industries moving forward? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm kind of conflicted on that um, a bit. I mean, if you're a middle schooler and you're learning quantum, I mean, great, but I don't think you're going to be up and ready to go for a number of years and the industry might have moved on, might not have. So it's really you're doing it because you're interested if you're a graduate student or maybe an undergraduate, then learning it now makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of things going on in quantum. There's a lot of really interesting things that are happening from almost every angle across the industry, across the world, um, across the government, and just many, many exciting things happening in quantum. Brick BT, right? Um, so here we are. Uh, and I think, I think you know, the exciting part is just that we are now seeing how far this can go. And now I think it's just inviting people in and letting them come play with all the things that we have. Get everyone in the sandbox together, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and teach them where the toys are and we can all play. So then uh, with regards to maybe your own uh, personal work, what, what do you see as being some of the, the things uh, you're excited about focusing on the, over the next couple of years? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll say what I'm excited about. Um, so in terms of my research at Dartmouth, we do a lot of things with um, uh, quantum computing and simulating electronic systems. Um, and what I'm really excited about is to see how things progress. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a passive way. I mean, to really see how things progress this year, right now, September, to next year, this time September, to the year after, this time September, and see if we can actually see progress in terms of the devices, in terms of the algorithm, in terms of the outcomes that we're getting. So people talk of quantum supremacy and there's all this excitement around the quantum supremacy Google results, but it's not really practical. So if I ask how well you did on a practical problem, you can give, I didn't do well this year, but that's fine. That's even better to do bad the first year, right? It's like sandbagging a test. And then the next year you're like, oh, I did four times better. And you look like a hero because you went from a D to an A. And so it's a similar idea that you can imagine quantum computing picking up year to year huge breakthroughs, you know, fantastic new algorithms, maybe new ways of optimizing things, new heuristics, that it's very hard to kind of see the forest for the trees. There's so many papers coming out, there's so many efforts, so many people being involved, that I would like to see a clear line of progress from A to B, and B to C, and C to D, and just see how it's progressing over time, rather than kind of shooting for the moon and, and just saying, well, this is where the moon's at. So. 
Well, I know I can say one positive thing about this so far is that uh, we have a lot of people <laughs> inquiring about uh, you know, what you've shared today and, and starting to understand more about the educational side of things of uh, you know, building curriculums to empower uh, the next generation of learning around the subject. Yeah. Um, so that is, you know, mission accomplished for all of us today, I think, if, uh, if we've gotten that excitement generated. So definitely thanks for that. Um, do, you, do you have any other thoughts uh, just around the, the educational landscape and some of the things that you're working on, not just at Dartmouth, but maybe what you're seeing across the uh, landscape of higher ed and the, the country and globally? Yeah, no, it's really exciting what's going on now with quantum education. I mean, it's fantastic. There's a lot of master's programs starting up. Um, there's a lot of uh, programs. That, I mean, Qbrade is fantastic, right? I also use Qbrade in my courses. Um, some of my colleagues here also use it. Um, and the success that Qbrade's brought, I think, is, is fantastic. Um, and, and I think across the board, as far as education goes, I think there's a lot of opportunities, I think, in many ways, to rewrite some of the language and some of the textbook and some of the invitationals of quantum. That when we think about um, even Nielsen and Chuang, I was reading through their book and they have this introduction to quantum mechanics that I feel is very outdated. They use linear algebra and then they use postulates of quantum mechanics. And this is all the things I said not to do, right? And, and not to knock it. I love that book. Um, the book's also 20 years old. If you think about uh, most of the quantum mechanics textbooks that people use, they're 20, 30 years old. And so these aren't necessarily appropriate for people who aren't in physics. These are all quantum physics books, quantum mechanics books. So I think getting from quantum mechanics to quantum engineering, I think this is going to be a very important step that's going to happen across the educational landscape. I think a lot more engineering programs will be involved inside of quantum, a lot more um, efforts to you know, bring in cloud engineers. So a lot of the cloud computing that's going on quantum computing will invite more people from the network side of things. Think about pulse controls. It's a lot of very interesting things that people can come in and really add their expertise. And I think there's a lot of places that we can even, even push classical computation, right? So we think about um, quantum supremacy, pushing classical computers to do the same quantum supremacy experiment better is better for everybody. As long as we pick a problem that's of practical interest, then we all get better at it. And, and I think it's also good that the quantum computing industry can push classical computing as much as it pushes quantum computing along the way. Uh, technology adoption, I mean, bad qubits are good sensors. There's a lot of fantastic things that are extremely exciting. And I think now is definitely a time to get started in quantum. If, if any of you guys are out there wondering, which should you wait till next year? Should you wait till next month? No, apply now. You know, learn this stuff today, send me an email, I'll send you some slides and you can get started. So um, that's that's my suggestion. That was actually going to be my, <laughs> my follow-up question to you was uh, just asking you in general, like, um, you know, not just encouraging people to get involved, but um, do you have any general thoughts beyond what you just said about some of the types of jobs or opportunities? Um, do you think it's kind of sky's the limit right now because it's such a nascent industry? But I know we've had some inquiries about, okay, if I learn this stuff, how, how does it translate? Is it a competitive advantage or, you know, yeah, such of things? Um, so maybe I can, I can uh, follow up on the advice that I already gave, which is kind of like the blanket answer to that question. I guess maybe I can give the, uh, maybe a little more of a granular version of it that I think if you are looking for jobs and you're in position to hit the job market or even close to a position to hit the job market, I would apply now. I would go now, apply for the internship tomorrow. I wouldn't wait too long, okay? And this is because the industry is really hot. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of money coming in, a lot of government support. Brick VT's here, you know, cube raids inside of accelerators and then they're, you know, taking off that, you know, they're hiring and things like that. I'm not sure if they're hiring, but nonetheless, the point is, is that um, they have internships, they have hiring. There's a lot of companies that are starting up a lot of places that you can go find a job. And it's a matter of knocking on doors right now. And so that's if you're close to going out, if you're a senior in college, if you're a master's program, or if you're a PhD student who's close to graduating. If you're a PhD student who's starting or you're a middle schooler or you're, you know, in high school, I would say do this because you love it. Quantum mechanics to me is fantastically interesting. Just probability itself is super interesting. And then quantum mechanics, all the things that are going on, it's very exciting, but I will only do it out of love. And I, that's, my, that's my takeaway. Um, if you're close to getting a job, then go, go now. And if you're doing it, do it out of love. You know, that, and that's how I ended up in quantum computing is that I really enjoyed physics. I really enjoyed chemistry. I really enjoyed putting these together. I enjoyed computer science. And this was a nice way to kind of be able to hop around as much as I wanted and still be doing the same thing. The quantum just pulls from so many different directions that it's just really nice to kind of make a ball of yarn out of many different threads. So. Love that analogy. Um, so just to throw this out there, if anyone wants to throw some questions in, 
Uh, we still have a few more minutes left. Uh, please feel free to submit in the Q&A area and we'll maybe give it a minute or two and uh, I'll ask maybe one more uh, question of, from James and, and then we can uh, wrap up there and give everyone the heads up on um, what we look like heading into the afternoon with regards to the agenda and some exciting announcements. Uh, I guess in general, so me being a neophyte, but being in the tech industry, uh, you know, this is going outside of education, but uh, where do you see uh, the biggest impact coming out of quantum as it develops? Um, would there be a particular industry you would pick? Or uh, do you think it's just across the board? And I know that's kind of a, a baiting question, but I just figured it's kind of interesting to see, you know, which industries are gaining the most momentum, even though everyone's kind of jumping into the sandbox. Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a great question. It's an open question, I'd say. Um, if, if I'm guessing, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, but I can say a little bit about how I got into quantum, and maybe that'll answer the question more than more than a concrete please answer do. about the future. Yeah, please do. <laughs> maybe from the past. Um, so I got into quantum because I was interested in how do we understand electrons? How do we understand fermions? How do we understand how they evolve? How do we understand how they move? Um, and this is coming from a chemistry background mixed with a lot of math inside of it, so, and a lot of physics on top of that. So then I really got into chemistry, thinking about how electrons and then they got into chemistry and started thinking about electrons. And then from electrons, started thinking about electronic structure and from electronic structure, then just fermionic structure. And that's how we're now in the physics department doing all sorts of things in quantum and quantum simulation. Um, so that's to say that I put my uh, efforts and thoughts and time and, and intelligence behind quantum simulation. So fingers crossed that it works, right? <laughs> so that's that's where I, I'm, I'm betting on. I think quantum simulation is really um, the place that you can really move and see the best path forward, because what is a quantum computer if not a way of doing time, quantum time evolution, right? And so you're really trying to think of when does quantum time evolution give you an advantage? When does quantum time evolution allow you to do something you couldn't have done otherwise? And that's where I really think that how we can leverage quantum time evolution is really the question at the heart of what a quantum computer can do. And, and time evolution shows up naturally inside of quantum chemistry, shows up naturally inside of physics, where you talk about perturbing some system and seeing how it evolves. And so this is a very natural question from the physics point of view. And I think how this applies to other areas, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, not that I don't know off the top of my head, I can give you the story, but it's all a story that people are just, you know, throwing up in the air and, and no one really knows. I think people have a lot of ideas, but I don't think anyone really knows. I guess that's the, the beauty of it, right? Is that it's uh, so nascent that there's, uh, it had, dare I say, infinite opportunity uh, yeah. in the future. So, well, like I said, truly appreciate uh, your talk and view on um, things that everyone should know from the perspective of education. And just so everyone else in our audience knows, that's that was the main focal point of this morning is really giving an overview of how to get into quantum uh, computing and, and the industry from the point of view of education, things you need to know. So James, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and, and share your presentation. And uh, yeah, we look forward to keep in touch as we go forward. So thank Happy you to very do it. much. Yeah, all the best for QBraid and, uh, and Brick. Thanks, we appreciate the support. Yeah, of course.